for joining us for KSAT News at 9. I'm Courtney Friedman. We're continuing to follow the latest COVID-19 news. There are now 29 cases that we know about locally. Here's a breakdown of those cases. Eight are travel related. Four cases are people who have had close contact with travel related cases and six are community transmitted. Today marks the first confirmed cases that have been community spread. Eight cases are still under 11 cases rather are still under investigation. Statewide, there are more than 140 cases and five deaths related to COVID-19. Nationwide, more than 10,000 people have the coronavirus and at least 150 have died. Across Texas and here at home, more actions taken to combat the spread of the virus. San Antonio City Council voted to extend a ban on dining in restaurants for another 30 days. And Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf issued a new emergency declaration following a public health disaster declaration by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. The uh, health care uh, disaster that they declared, that's the first time that's been declared since 1901. So you can see this is a, a much different uh, scenario that we're facing today than we've ever, well over 100, 100 years ago now since the last one is declared. The county's new declaration and the state's declaration both include bans on dining in restaurants. San Antonio's tourism scene is already taking a major hit during this pandemic. During today's council meeting, we learned that several hotels in the area are reporting occupancy rates of less than 10%. The hotel occupancy tax rate brings in about $96 million a year. Meanwhile, the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center says 28 of the 49 events have already canceled or been postponed. The Alamo Dome has 10 of 31 events cancel or postpone. And the two venues together typically generate a combined 30 $3 million per year. Governor Greg Abbott hosted a virtual town hall tonight regarding COVID-19 and low hotel occupancy is actually one of the things that was addressed. Abbott says there is a possibility of using some of these empty hotels as a place to isolate people who have tested positive for COVID-19. But they don't have extreme uh, health based issues. They just they need a place where they can isolate uh, for two weeks uh, in their own room uh, with access to a bathroom uh, and that would allow them to convalesce and then reenter uh, wherever they were living before that. Governor Abbott also reassured pres uh, residents that money is not an issue for the state. He has access to $150 million in disaster relief funding if federal aid is not enough. And new tonight, expiration dates for Texas ID cards, Texas driver's licenses, and commercial driver's licenses, and election identification certificates have been extended. This due to the governor's state of disaster declaration. So what this means is if your ID card expires on or after March 13th, it will remain valid for an additional 60 days. In the meantime, all driver's license offices are closed until further notice. So you're stuck at home and probably using your cable and internet more than ever. A lot of you have been calling and writing it to KSAT, asking if your services will be cut off if you can't pay due to financial impacts of the coronavirus. Well, we have great news for you. This week, the FCC called on telecommunications companies across the nation to take a Keep Americans Connection pledge. They're asking the companies to pledge several things for the next 60 days for people and businesses affected financially by the pandemic. First, they will not terminate services. Second, they will waive any late fees. And third, they will open Wi-Fi hotspots to any American who needs them. Less than 24 hours after the FCC announcement, dozens of companies made the pledge, including AT&T, Spectrum, Grande Communications, and we did ask for GVTC to give us a response, but they have not responded yet. We also asked what's happening with the technical service employees who have to go into people's homes to fix their equipment. All the companies we contacted said the same thing. Their techs are still working, but under several conditions. They will pre-screen customers asking if they are sick or have been in contact with anyone who's sick. If so, they will try to serve the customer over the phone or by video. They'll also ramp up hygiene procedures, washing hands and using hand sanitizer. Please be honest with the technicians about your health. They are risking their own health to be there at your home. Also, when it comes to returning equipment, most companies are asking that you mail them in or follow specific instructions when dropping them off. Make sure you check out the company website for those specific requirements. We have all this information on our website, ksat.com. Many schools across the U.S. are closed to avoid the spread of coronavirus, including here in San Antonio. But how are districts making sure all students continue learning while at home? 
Southwest ISD is transitioning to an online learning system at campuses that remain closed this month. Tiffany Huertas has a closer look at how the community is coming together to help students stay on track academically. Recess, friends, homework. Those are some of the things nine-year-old Randy Ponce misses about going to school. We're just explaining to them that people are getting sick and we just want to make sure we stay home, we stay safe, we stay healthy. Um, so hopefully that soon they'll be able to get to see their friends and their teachers and go back to their everyday life. Because of the coronavirus, schools in our community closed their doors. But soon Randy will begin learning again. It's just hard keeping them entertained because they don't have much to do. So I think the Chromebooks are going to help a lot. One after another another. Families drove up to Sun Valley Elementary School to check out Chromebooks as the campus moves to online teaching. Starting on Monday, we're going to full online, and so the students will be logging in to get their assignments. They're going to be interacting with their teachers through platforms like Google Meet um, and Zoom, and so they'll be able to connect with their teachers daily also. There you go. Thank you. Families have been getting notifications through an app called Remind. I sent information out to the parents yesterday um, with a newsletter that basically gave all the information about what we were doing and how the district was moving to online learning. About 650 students attend Sun Valley Elementary School. Today, staff handed out about 300 Chromebooks to help students continue to learn from home. We're already in the middle of the year. We have a lot of curriculum that we're still working on, you know, exposing our children to. So now we have to be very creative. Another big change this school year. The STAR test was canceled. I think that was a relief to a lot of our parents and our students and even the teachers because we've missing so much um, instruction day to day with our students that we were a little concerned about that. Now teachers are focusing on getting school material so students stay on track and families couldn't be more relieved that their education is continuing. I think this is fantastic. For The Nine, Tiffany Huertas. Good to see the community helping. There are 18 campuses at Southwest ISD, and as we said, every school's handing out technology for students to learn while at home. The district is also providing curbside meals for the students for breakfast and lunch at designated locations. You can find all of this information on our website, ksat.com. Now let's turn to tonight's 9 at 9. Here's a look at how COVID-19 is impacting communities around the world. Here's tonight's 9 at 9. Italy has just surpassed China for the highest number of deaths related to COVID-19. The total number of cases in the country rose to more than 40,000. The death toll has reached 3,400 people. The World Health Organization says that's over 200 more than China. Last week's unemployment claims spiked to 281,000 Americans, their highest level in two and a half years. To put it in perspective, that's more than what happened in any week during the Great Recession. The administration has argued unemployment could reach 20% without the president's economic relief package. Congress worked urgently today to create a $1 trillion measure to prop up households and the U.S. economy amid the outbreak. The first proposal is to send Americans aid checks, potentially $3,000 for a family of four. It is critical that we move swiftly and boldly to begin to stabilize our economy preserve Americans' jobs, get money to workers and families, and keep up our fight on the health front. Also, Congress wants to ramp up production of medical supplies and rapidly create temporary field hospitals. Check this out, beaches in Florida are packed with people. This despite the fact that Florida's governor issued an order today to limit gatherings on beaches to no more than 10. The governor wants spring break vacationers to know the party is over. The Miami-Dade County mayor ordered all beaches, parks, and non-essential businesses to close. On the opposite spectrum, streets in Paris are deserted as a result of the outbreak. The French health agency is reporting almost 11,000 cases as of today. French citizens are urged to respect lockdown measures imposed by the government. You'll never believe what smugglers are sneaking into the country now. Customs and Border Protection officers in Chicago seized counterfeit coronavirus test kits. Authorities intercepted the shipment Tuesday at O'Hare Airport's mail facility. The illegal shipment originated in the United Kingdom. Speaking of the UK, Prince Harry's Invictus Games has been postponed for 2020. The adaptive sports event features wounded and injured armed service personnel. The games were scheduled to be held in the Netherlands in May. Organizers are hoping to reschedule the games to May or June 2021. 
A growing number of U.S. colleges are preparing to turn empty dorms into temporary housing for patients with coronavirus. Colleges also say they are ready to make them available to hospital workers, and they're even considering utilizing dining halls. So they have a backup, they have the ability to deliver meals to isolation units as well as the students that are on their campus. Campus staff with military backgrounds are leading the logistics and planning on how to isolate parts of campus that would house sick patients. One woman is bringing a little Christmas joy to folks dealing with the pandemic by putting all her Christmas lights and decorations back up. The idea made the rounds on social media and slowly more houses are adding the lights. Many sharing their own pictures with the hashtag lights for life and Corona kindness. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. Good evening. Obviously a ton going on as far as news is concerned, but there's also a lot going on in your weather forecast, especially over the next 24 to 36 hours. We've got some big changes coming your way. Chances of showers and storms return to the forecast late tonight through early tomorrow morning. A cold front rolls in tomorrow morning as well. That'll keep rain chances around through the day on Friday, even into Saturday. And that also sets us up for a chilly and damp weekend. We've got some colder air moving in overnight tonight, though. Things will be fairly mild temperature wise. We are expecting some scattered showers and thunderstorms to move in from the southwest. A few of these storms, especially closer to midnight, could be on the stronger side, producing some smaller hail and also some gusty winds. Temperatures only falling into the mid to upper 60s. And the interesting thing about your Friday is that the morning when we're around 67, 68 degrees, that'll be the warmest part of the day. Cold front rolls through about 7, 9 o'clock in the morning to send our temperatures into the mid to upper 50s by Friday afternoon. So a much cooler day on the way tomorrow. North northeast winds 15 to 25 gusting up to 30 miles per hour at times behind that front and all day tomorrow. Skies will stay cloudy with a chance of scattered showers and a few rumbles of thunder. Rain chances continue into Saturday though, so we've got two very chilly days. Definitely worthy of staying in binge watching your favorite show, catching a movie marathon, something like that. Things will finally start to warm up Sunday for the end of the weekend as we see a bit more sunshine. But by early and middle part of next week, temperatures will be quite warm again, climbing back into the mid to upper 80s. Thank you so much, Katie. Well, we have amazing news for you tonight. We have a brand new member of the KSAT family. I know y'all have been waiting for this. News at 9 anchor Myra Arthur has given birth to a healthy baby boy. She says the whole family is doing well. We are so, so excited for her. Uh, usually she's watching. She's probably not tonight because her hands are literally full, <laughs> but we are so excited. And if you are watching Myra, we love you. Coming up after the break, Steve Spreester is here and he's joined tonight by the senior laboratory manager from University Health Systems to talk about the desperate need for blood donations. We'll be back in one minute. Coronavirus Q&A, getting answers to your most pressing questions during an uncertain time. Welcome back to the KSAT News at 9. That's the goal of this new section dedicated to talking to experts about things you need to know about. Tonight, we're joined by Deborah Serna, the senior laboratory manager from University Health Systems, to talk about the need for blood and how we can all help out when it comes to blood donations. Deborah, thank you for joining us again uh, tonight. Talk about the need and just how, just how pressing is it? So the need is pretty great because we've had a drop in donations. We don't have the supply we normally do. And so it's really, really needed right now that we get blood. A lot of the blood mobiles that people had scheduled and a lot of the special events had to be canceled because of coronavirus, correct? Yes, correct. We've had a lot of our blood drives cancel. And so that is a big dent in our, in our blood supply. All right, let's get to some of our viewer questions that we have tonight. Can mosquitoes transmit the coronavirus? Can COVID-19 spread through blood? That's actually one of the questions we got from viewers. As far as we know, the coronavirus does not spread through blood. We haven't had any cases. They're still doing studies and there's a lot we don't know about the virus. But for now, we know that it does not it's not transmissible through blood. It is safe to donate. Correct. Yes, very safe. Can you give blood if you have diabetes? Diabetes is obviously one of the big health concerns in San Antonio and South Texas. 
So for most diabetics is are not on insulin. Um, it's usually okay to donate if you have an oral medication that you're taking. If you're a regular donor, you've been donating for years, it's not an issue. You you can still donate. Okay, so if you, I think I think what you said is if you're not on insulin, you should be able to donate based on your medications, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Correct. You're breaking up on us a little bit with the Skype signal, but what, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. What precautions do uh, you at UHS use before people give blood? I mean, it, when I walk in to give blood, let's say tomorrow at the blood drive that KSAT 12 is having, will you take my temperature? What kind of th precautions will you take? Definitely. We usually take your temperature as part of the normal screening process for blood donation. But this time we're taking it the first thing as soon as you walk up to the donor area. And that's just so that way we can verify that your temperature is good before you enter the rest of the donation area with the rest of the donors. Also with our staff, we wanna make sure that they are protected as well. And so we will take your temperature at first. We will ask some screen questions too. If you've been out of the country, where have you traveled in the last 28 days? And again, that's just that order. If you're if you're anemic, can you give blood? So if you're anemic, unfortunately, you can't, and that's something that was before even coronavirus. Um, so if your iron or hemoglobin level is below a certain amount, then you don't have enough blood to give. And so there, there are certain ways that you can help. Some people have low iron or some people can eat certain foods or take certain vitamins to help increase that. Is there any kind of blood type that you're looking for that's more important than others? Like a, I think O negative is the universal donor, but is there any certain type of blood that you're looking for more so than others? We're looking for all types this time. Sometimes we have a need for the universal donor more than others. But this time we need all types. So we are we are definitely taking everyone that's that's willing to donate. Have you ever experienced anything like this? You, you said earlier that you'd been at University Health Systems for 10 years. Have you ever experienced anything like this that's affected the blood supply this much? Not like this, for sure, because it is a not only side side issue. And so because of that, it is something that I've never seen before there. All right, but the need is great. And again, you can donate University Health System anytime. We're having a blood drive tomorrow, but we're very happy to report that blood drive is full. But there are other locations that you can uh, donate. Uh, is, donatebloodtoday.com, is that the uh, website that we were talking about earlier? Yes. Yeah. Yes, correct. You can go there to schedule your appointment. Um, that's part of one of the measures that we're taking to you know, reduce crowding. And so definitely make an appointment there to come visit us after the blood drive. All right, Deborah Serna with the University Health Systems. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Again, we are trying to separate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. Trying to separate the fact from the fear in some of these questions. And we will continue to do this program every night as long as this crisis continues. We'll be right back. News and the uncertainty surrounding the coronavirus pandemic continues. It's putting a lot of stress on everyone. Among those concerns, getting groceries. But now there may be an unconventional way for people to get what they need. Some restaurants have started selling their stock. Seth Williams, the general manager of Halcyon Coffee Shop and Stella Public House in Southtown, says he got the idea when he was thinking of how he could continue to keep his 70 employees paid. He realized he could make money by selling the products that are delivered to his store, things like eggs, milk, and produce. I need to think about what I can do to help and help not just my kids, but everyone else out there. So we got to pivot, we got to change, we got to adapt. Is it a tough time right now? Absolutely, it's a tough time, but we'll get through it. William says he is working to create a website where people can order the items that they want.
Meanwhile, the Pearl Farmers Market is helping facilitate something pretty similar. The closure of some restaurants is having a trickle down effect on the local farmers who supply them with organic produce. St. Hedwig farmer J Cody Scott says he's turning to online orders to his website to help recover his losses. The Pearl Farmers Market announced it would shut down last week. Scott sells at the Pearl too. But for the first time ever, the Pearl is helping connect its loyal clients with growers virtually. They launched a curbside pickup order system where clients can continue to support farmers once a week. It's it's a uh, live or die for these for these vendors. Um, if if we don't support our local vendors, then they will not make it through this period of time. Sales for this week have closed. 400 customers purchased goods from local farmers and ranchers. The first orders will be picked up tomorrow. Turning to tonight's top stories, last week's unemployment claims spiked to 281,000 Americans, the highest level in two and a half years. That's a jump of 70,000 from the week before and 60,000 more than economists expected. It marked a 33% increase, the largest since 1992 in terms of percentage. A Bear County jail inmate who has been quarantined since Tuesday has tested negative for COVID-19, but 11 BCSO deputies that came in contact with an infected university health system doctor are currently under quarantine. Meanwhile, the jail is seeing a slight decrease in population. This comes just a day after county officials instituted a new policy allowing the release of nonviolent offenders. A BCSO spokesman says 145 people were released yesterday and there were only 137 new bookings. Toyota is expanding its suspension of production at all auto and components plants in North America. That includes the one here in San Antonio. Manufacturing facilities will be closed March 23rd through April 3rd. Production is scheduled to resume on April 6th. Toyota says it will continue to pay employees during the 10 day shutdown. As we've been saying since before the coronavirus outbreak became a pandemic, there are lots of questions surrounding it. One of the big ones you may have asked is, isn't this the same as the flu? It is not. RJ Marquez breaks down why health experts say it's much worse and helps us understand some of the major differences. Some of the symptoms are similar, like fever and cough, but there are major differences between COVID-19 and the seasonal flu, and what this new disease does to a person's body and to those around them. Researchers with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say that right now, on average, a person with COVID-19 will infect two and a half people. For the seasonal flu, it's 1.3. Another major difference, the incubation time, which is defined as the time from first exposure to first symptoms. According to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, for the seasonal flu, you're looking at one to four days with most people showing symptoms in about two days. For COVID-19, the virus can remain in a person's body for up to 14 days before they show any symptoms. The next two stats are key. The first one is the hospitalization rate. According to the CDC, it's about 20% for someone infected with COVID-19 compared to just 2% for the flu. Second, the fatality rate for confirmed cases. It's 1 to 3.4% right now for people infected with the new coronavirus and 0.1 or less for someone with the flu. The virus is also deadlier for people older than 80. This is not meant to downplay the flu in the U.S., which kills thousands of people every year. But keep in mind, there is currently no vaccine for COVID-19. And since this is a new virus, humans have not built an immunity to it. For The Nine, RJ Marquez. Home, you may have noticed the trend of transitioning two way frontage roads to one way. The Texas Department of Transportation says the goal is to increase safety and reduce congestion. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how this will impact our community. Most of the highways uh, have been built originally for, for many years, right? Decades, you know, going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s. Two way frontage roads along highways were common in those times. A lot of times this was out in the rural areas, you know, they, ha they didn't have the urban density and extreme population growth that we have nowadays. It was more accessible for people because they didn't have exit ramps for many miles. But things began to change in the 90s. You were starting to see, with a lot of urban growth, you were starting to see a lot of collisions on the frontage roads, head-on collisions. TxDOT says that's when their statewide frontage road project began. It was around that time that they said, you know, we're gonna start converting the roads from two-way to one-way, as well as any other future projects to incorporate one way to begin with. 
Since then, TxDOT has been changing two-way frontage roads to one way. Right now, it's working on converting the I-10 frontage roads between Greytown Road and File Road. The beginning part of it is on the one-way system, but the latter part of it, again, as you start getting out more towards the uh, rural areas, is still on the two-way system. So that portion of it is going to be switched. While this is happening, what should drivers expect? The left frontage road lane will be closed on both the eastbound and westbound sides of I-10 between Greytown and File. Plus, there will be temporary exit and entrance ramps on I-10. Rosenberg says the whole state is trying to move toward one-way frontage roads to help reduce congestion and for safety reasons. When you have the frontage road uh, coming down to like an overpass or something like that, when you have traffic lights, it's going to make it better. So that the traffic light signals are going to move faster. Rosenberg says the amount of frontage roads they change depends on funding. He says they have to widen the roads from 11 feet to 12 feet for the one way, and they also have to add shoulders to incorporate pedestrian and bicycle lanes. Hey guys, as you can see, we're here in my apartment for trending today because of the social distancing we're trying to implement. But I promise you, not everything is as bleak as it seems. There are still some good things going on right now and some good things to talk about. So the first story of the day is that you can now get alcohol delivered to you when you make these orders to some of those uh, restaurants that you still dying to eat from. You can still eat from them under these orders as long as they deliver. And now Governor Greg Abbott said he uh, waived some regulations so you guys can get those drinks delivered to you as long as you order something to eat with it. So date night doesn't have to go away even if you're in isolation with the one you love. It works out great. Uh, our second story of the day is uh, still about food. There's a lot of San Antonio restaurants offering a lot of great deals, um, a lot of good to go deals, both for curbside pickup and for delivery. Uh, Papa's Burgers is one of them. That's a great choice. You got Sea Island if you like seafood. Um, and we're updating this article constantly to bring up any deals that these restaurants are letting us know about. Um, so Fuddruckers is another one that I absolutely love. I'm a big fan of burgers. And so during this time, it's okay to like think of it as a hibernation, maybe eat a lot of food, uh, bulk up, and then come back out in the spring just like bears do. Why not? Um, our last story of the day is just because of all the social distancing going on, it doesn't mean that you don't get to connect with your faith. There is one San Antonio church here, the Blessed uh, Catholic Church, Blessed Sacrament Catholic Church here in San Antonio, held a drive through confessional uh, on Thursday for some parishioners to just drive through, make a quick confession, and still sort of feel that connection, even though a lot of church services aren't going on right now, a lot of them being live streamed in lieu of them being held in congregation together, which is what a lot of people are used to in their communities. But this is kind of cool. Now the church says there are no additional plans for more drive-through confessionals, but of course that may change as these circumstances continue. So look out for that uh, and look out for each other and take care of yourselves. Every Thursday on KSAT News at 9, we revisit big events and important people and places that have shaped San Antonio. In 2019, the University of the Incarnate Word celebrated its 150th anniversary. At the time, Myra Arthur shared the story of UIW's background. It's tonight's Throwback Thursday. The foundation of the University of the Incarnate Word can be traced back to a single letter in 1869. That letter was sent from a bishop in San Antonio to the Catholic sisters in France. The letter asked for the sisters' help to care for victims of a cholera outbreak in the city. Without hesitation, three sisters made their way to San Antonio and established the city's first hospital, the Santa Rosa Clinic. They primarily cared for the poor and single mothers. While the women were in the hospital, the sisters took care of them. And in some instances, if the patient died, they kept on taking care of the kids and they started an orphanage. The sisters decided to teach the orphans subjects like writing and math. In 1881, they received a state charter to educate children. They opened a school at the George Brackenridge Estate, which became the college and the academy of the Incarnate Word. 
and that's the main administration building. It has grade school, high school, and, and college students. In 1913, a young woman from Durango, Mexico, named Antonia Mendoza, became Incarnate Word's first graduate. Since then, the university has awarded thousands of degrees in fields ranging from philosophy to business, always trying to keep the mission of service in mind. Today, uh, all our students are required to perform service hours. Every year, the university honors its connections to the past with a celebration, symbolizing the passing of the torch from one generation to the next. At Christmas time, we celebrate uh, you know, the nativity of the Lord. It's a, understandably a huge celebration here on campus that we call Light the Way. It all goes back to a plea for help, a trio of Catholic sisters willing to make a sacrifice to help the sick here in San Antonio. These three young women in the early 20s had to leave France and without knowing English and say, well, we'll learn it. Uh, without really knowing nursing, well, we'll learn it, we'll do it. And a drum roll, please. Milk! We want to end with some great news. We are extending our KSAT Community Virtual Phone Bank Benefiting Meals on Wheels has been extended an hour. It will now wrap up at 1030. Thank you so much to donations. The viewers, we've raised at least $30,000 so far. It's unbelievable. If you'd like to donate, call the number on your screen. Things like this make me love living in San Antonio, even in hard times. They're all there for each other. Thanks so much for watching. The Night Beat starts at 10.